satyam shivam sundaram which means the truth is that god is beautiful <laughs> i love this make a vow to be happy now <laughs> yogi jo yog mein sada hi rahe prabhu ke yog mein rahe if you had looked at me from outside you would have said this girl has everything <laughs> But if you had been inside of me, you would have known that I was living with a a very pervasive sense of lack. Then what brought you to India? I came to India really only because I knew that I could eat and eat really happily. The Maa Ganga opened the journey towards it and Swami ji closed it. He was the glue that brought all of the different aspects of the experience together and what we earn others will burn <laughs> yes insaan mein hi bhagwan hai bhagwan nahi aasman mein hai but you beat wow. me you beat me to it you know what you beat me to it we're not in a race we're going together we're going hand in hand <laughs>
I didn't feel like my life was full. I didn't feel like who I was was right or enough. You're never quite beautiful enough or successful enough or smart enough or happy enough or worthy enough. And I was no different. I had all of those complexes and insecurities. Came to India, not even as much as my ego would love to claim 28 years later, not even because I was on a spiritual quest. <laughs> I didn't know there was something to seek for. That's what that generalized angst comes from, is when we don't know where to find what we want, there's, there's a generalized sense of hopelessness and helplessness and resignation. I didn't even know that there was this possibility of a life. I was not religious. I was not someone who identified as spiritual. I was an academic. I was a scientist. And... Then what brought you to India? So this is, this is the crazy thing, is I, I loved to travel. I had done a lot of travel. But it was mostly always in Europe, England, across America, you know, what you can think of as what we used to call first world countries, right? <laughs> so I had, I had done all of that growing up with my parents, had spent a lot of time in Europe, a lot of time in England. I had traveled across the US. I didn't know anything about India. I wasn't interested in India, but I was, I was married at the time. It's sort of a bit of trivia about me that most people don't know. Um, it was very, very short. It was right after undergraduate. I was only 22. Um, we were only married for a few years, but he wanted to come to India. Okay. In an effort to save what was clearly already the end of a marriage that had kind of just started. Um, I said yes. And the other piece that made me say yes, the main thing for me, because, you know, we were coming for three months. It was a big trip. I was taking a whole semester off of my PhD program. I was a very strict vegetarian. What made you a vegetarian? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because I was not raised a vegetarian. Exactly. I was born in 71, so I grew up in the 70s and the early 80s. Vegetarianism was not a big thing in America at that time. I, from, from early childhood, I never could cut meat. So I ate it, but I would always need my mom to like cut it up for me or stick it into a salad <laughs> or put it in a big sandwich. I could never just eat a piece of meat that you had to cut. And then at the age of 15, I was in France at the home of a friend of mine who was French. And suddenly, in the middle of this fancy European Christmas dinner with all of these different courses, suddenly I looked at quail, a, a bird, a yep. delicacy that her mother had put on my plate. And my friend points to the knife that I'm supposed to use to cut the string. There was still a piece of string around the quail. And suddenly I realized, oh my God, my food has to be untied before I eat it. And in that moment, it was like just this epiphany moment. Oh my God, this isn't food, this is life. Yeah. And I couldn't touch the quail. Oh my God. And I never could touch any non-vegetarian food after that. So it just came from... Just this... in that moment, wow. quail sitting on my plate, <laughs> <laughs> sitting at one of these very uh, big mahogany tables, the European Christmas dinners, you know, <laughs> huge family there. In that moment, I couldn't touch it. So I became a very bucka vegetarian. <laughs> and my friends used to call me a vegetarist <laughs> because I 
would give them a lot of trouble for eating meat yeah. whenever they would eat meat. And so when he suggested to come to India. He was not vegetarian. He was. I had actually made him vegetarian. <laughs> okay. it, it made, he was not vegetarian yeah. when we met. I had made him vegetarian. It was a a non-negotiable prerequisite. There was no way I was going to be in a relationship with someone who wasn't a vegetarian. But he was somewhat more flexible than I was in a lot of ways. And so for me, I I knew that in India, I could get bakka vegetarian food. Lots, lots of it, yeah. In, and it was good food. Yeah. I loved Indian food. But in, you know, 30 years ago in Europe, in England, even across the United States, getting bakka vegetarian food, meaning also no eggs, no fish, you know, in a lot of those places they think vegetarian just means you don't eat red meat. Yeah. Oh, it's only chicken. Oh, it's only <laughs> fish. Oh, it's only eggs. So I knew that I could get bakka pure vegetarian food. So as embarrassing as it is to admit almost 30 years later, I came to India really only because I knew that I could eat and eat really happily for the whole three months that we were going to be here. But this is grace because grace doesn't require that you know in advance. Grace doesn't require that you've got the whole flight manifest and plan. Grace only requires that you surrender. And so I had surrendered to this trip to India, even though it didn't make sense to me. Mm. I didn't know why I was going. I was living in Palo Alto in the San Francisco Bay Area where I could get beautiful Indian vegetarian food on my corner. There was no reason to come to India for vegetarian food. But Grace and the Divine had other plans and Rishikesh was the first place we came. <laughs> I opened a 500 page Lonely Planet guidebook in Delhi. You know, it was 1996, so there was no Google. And I said, Rishikesh, <laughs> get to Rishikesh. I stand on the banks of Ganga. And I had this experience of being in the presence of God. And as I said, I wasn't religious. I wasn't someone who even identified as spiritual. But it was undeniable, unmistakable. There I was in the presence of the divine. And the divine permeated everything. Wherever I looked, it was just God. And it was also in me. It wasn't me over here and then God over there. Me here, divinity there. It was nothing but divinity. Was that your aha moment when you came to Absolutely, him? absolutely. It was, it was the every moment. Okay. <laughs> um, it was the moment of Realizing and recognizing myself, the universe, my place in the universe. And I knew this is where I meant to be. So that was, that was really how I came. And believe it or not, that actually is the short version. <laughs> <laughs> but, but over the next, you know, seven, ten days after that, there were so many things, I won't go into all of the details, but there were so many experiences of the presence of grace keeping me here. I mean, I heard, I heard a voice telling me you must stay here. I had my feet literally glued to the ground of the ashram and I couldn't pick them up. All of these different things kept happening that were inexplicable by my scientific mindset. But the moment I surrendered out of that, they all very clearly pointed to the fact that I was meant to be here. And there was no second thought after that for you to go or not. I mean, you went back a couple several times after that to come back, but you knew this was it. Absolutely. 
absolutely. I knew that I had found my home. I knew that I was not just here visiting, but that this was really home. I didn't know at that point why or doing what. That didn't happen until I met my guru, His Holiness Puja Swami Chidananda Saraswati Ji. You'll, you'll have the blessing of speaking with him later. But it was only when I finally met him later on, about a week later, that I finally realized, oh, it's here. It's under him that, that I'm meant to be. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know Parmarth Nikathon. I didn't know anything. I just knew I am meant to be here. So the, gang, the Ma Ganga opened the journey towards it and Swamiji, closed it together i think that <laughs> would you put it like that and that uh, then it was it just flew after that it went on the flow went on and on yeah i i would say i would say ma ganga opened me brought me home filled me with all of the truth all of the blessings puja swami ji i think about it really as in that moment he was the glue that brought all of the different aspects of the experience together. I had had this experience on the banks of Ganga. I heard this voice saying, you must stay here. And yet, I had an education from Stanford. That's... Which, not only based on the education, but purely from a financial standpoint, you think, well, if there's a divine plan, why in the world would God or the universe spend that kind of money on my education sure. if all I was supposed to do was sit on the banks of Ganga and cry <laughs> ecstatic tears forever, yeah. right? All of these things, suddenly with Puja Swamiji, he was like the glue that brought it all together and suddenly it made sense. Oh, he's here running all of these beautiful programs for children, for women, for sick people, for the environment. Of course you need an education. Of course you need to be able to serve, not just with surrender, but actually also with ability and effectiveness and efficiency. Therefore you need an education. Oh, of course it is here in this capacity. So he really served as the glue that suddenly brought all of these different pieces of my life together. Amazing. You spoke, you've spoken of so many things and I'm going to now respond back to each of the things. Uh, so I was on a journey for 25 years, not so educated, but success after success after success. And after 25 years of working 18 hours a day, seven days a week, one day, one day after working so much, I said, I'm not happy. You, you spoke up so much as you started uh, talking, you said people want to be happy. And what are we taught when we are in school? Success equals happiness. I've written a book. Success is not happiness. Happiness is success. Yes. yes. <laughs> because, because if you are happy, then you're already successful. <laughs> so I, 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 I'm a happiness ambassador. So whoever I meet, I meet giving them a little ball and there's a little word, there's a, a message at the back of the ball which says Make a vow to be happy now. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. That is, you know, one of the things that I always share is we have the choice to choose happiness. Absolutely. We don't have a magic wand to change other people's karmic journeys or karmic packages. I can't make someone else not angry or not frustrated or not jealous or not resentful. But I can choose to be happy, to be in peace, even if Samnewala is <laughs> angry or resentful or competitive or jealous or greedy or whatever it may be my happiness is my choice it's so your, i love this <laughs> i love this make a vow to be happy now yes. so i used to tell people earlier the same ball it had a more uh, aggressive word it said the previous 
quote on the ball said if you can be glad but you choose to be sad then you are mad <laughs> it was you know sadly it's very funny for 25 years i was chasing success which equals happiness and i thought that success ala achievement was the peak of happiness and so what we do like you were in stanford ideally you were a science student you would get a good job a doctor whatever you would want to be and then you would go from peak to peak to peak to peak but what i realize and people don't realize is the ultimate peak is a cliff called death you're going to fall off and what we earn others will burn <laughs> Yes. It's, yeah, it's absolutely. So, so it's so funny that we are thinking and we have been programmed a mother tells the child come first in class be the school captain you must do and all through life we want achievement we forget the second peak is fulfillment and i was blessed to discover the third peak called enlightenment so my book says the three peaks of happiness our achievement for because you started talking on this but since your face glows with that bliss and that ananda and that joy so we are going to have a good conversation but put putting things together to see whether there are some loose pieces which we get fit in so i was also very religious i believed in lord shiva from 8 to 48 and somewhere when i was 30 i got a flash make a big statue of shiva and then i made a huge statue of shiva with the ganges flowing 65 foot which is about a five uh, five floor building that six six floor building and the ganges shooting up and in bangalore we have millions of people coming to see this i've just bought a small piece for you this is this uh, a miniature version of the, and to me <coughs> god was shiva like to some people god is krishna and some people <coughs> you must come to bang you've not seen this i think in bangalore have you been to bangalore i have and to the set to the temple i have not been to the temple i've been for a variety of different oh. functions and you programs you will be events. flabbergasted I will when come. when you come to bangalore you will be you will be it's going to be another experience of ma ganga to you i can assure you of that <laughs> so i got this flash because i was a devout believer i mean from 8 to 48 me to om namah shivaya you know yesterday <coughs> when you all were singing hari krishna yes. hari krishna and hari rama hari i wanted to say namah shivaya <laughs> we do we chant we chant yeah. om namah shivaya a lot yeah. so then i realized that people don't know god yes people are searching in a temple and in a church but this is a wrong search of course when we are a kid we are taught in school a for apple and b for ball and so we need <clears throat> jesus or we need krishna to understand that there is a power called god but sadhvi what i realized that just like we go from kindergarten to school college university we don't go from religion to spirituality and while all religions are good you must agree that there's no you you came from a jewish background i was told so whether you're jewish or christian catholic for that matter islam hindu i believe all religions are good but unfortunately and most unfortunately every religion says i am the best religion this is the best. and then people who love god so much Be, you know i cry i cry and say god people love you so much but then we go round and round in the merry go round of religion because we have our scripture and our ritual and and we forget the divine that is in the temple of the heart the bible but says but that's why that's why our sanatan dharma it's not it's not a dogma that's why we 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 say however you worship 
however you worship. You call God Shiva, beautiful. You say Shankar Bhagwan, beautiful. You say Krishna, beautiful. You say Ram, beautiful. You say Madurga, beautiful. You say Christ, beautiful. whatever you say, because it's not a dogma. It doesn't say you have to worship in this way or in this type of place or with this mantra or this prayer. It's why we say Sanatan Dharma. That that Sanatan. When we say, you know, eternal way of life. Oh, yes. It's not it's not just eternal in time. It's eternal in space. Meaning we know that that which Bhagwan Krishna taught us on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. That which we learn from Bhagwan Ram, whether in Ayodhya, whether in Lanka, whether in the jungles, wherever we learn it, we know that it's just as true today as it was thousands and thousands of years ago when they spoke it. But it, eternal also means in space, meaning that which is true in Kurukshetra, in Ayodhya, in Lanka, in Dwarka, in Mathura, in Vrindavan, wherever it is, is just as true. In Los Angeles or New York or Paris or Tokyo, that so that eternalness, and I, I, I jump in and mention this because it feels really important to me coming into this Dharma because what I've experienced here is so beautiful, is it's, it's a way of life that says, wherever you worship, however you worship, God is in you. And so you wanna, you wanna access God within you through a mirror of Shiva, beautiful. Through a <laughs> mirror of Krishna, beautiful. Through a mirror of Madurga, beautiful. Through a mirror of Ram, beautiful. Through a mirror of Om, beautiful. Through a mirror of the tree in your backyard or your grandmother, beautiful. But unfortunately, while I totally respect what you say, I must tell you this. What you say is the truth. What you're speaking of is Sanatan Dharma, which means eternal truth. But, like me, I was a strong Shiva Bhakt. And today people are strong Krishna Bhakt. And they are so much in avidya, you're familiar with the yes, word ignorance, of course, of course. that you, and I'm sorry to say, but this is important in our conversation because people who listen to this, and I'm, I hope you agree, I'm sure you do, Those who believe in Krishna are still waiting that one day they will go to Vaikuntha and they will meet Krishna. But this is a lie that God lives in the sky. The truth is that, the divine, you know, in Hindi I say, Insan mehi Bhagavan hai, Bhagavan nahi. Asman me hai, Kan kan me shakti. Prabhu ki hi hai, har jeev mein bhagwan hai. Which means in English that in every human being, there is God. Now, the world's biggest problem today is just this, that we are fighting each other in the name of religion. Whether it is Russia and Ukraine, Iran and Israel, whether it is in India, the conflicts, if only we realize God. Absolutely. If you, you, you agree with me completely, I hope. 100%. The, the dilemma though is we're using the name of God to fight. But if you really look at the core, we're not fighting over God. We're fighting over land. We're fighting over resources. We're fighting over money, we're fighting over power, we're using God's name. Absolutely. Because nobody, nobody's going to go out and risk their life. If I say, I want to be in charge of a bigger piece of land. I want to have more power. <laughs> Would you go out and risk your life? But if I say God wants you to do it. So Sadhvi. So we're using God. So, uh, they're manipulating. So sorry to say, this is my problem where I let go of religion. 
you know I, i'm not trying to be um, <clears throat> can you let go of kindergarten you cannot let go of kindergarten because without kindergarten you would never go to stamford you need to have abc but i don't know if you heard this or not earlier i used to pray to shiva now i pray through shiva beautiful because beautiful. shiva i i have not stopped praying to shiva but i don't say om namah shivaya i say shivoham shivoham which means shiva lives in the temple of my heart and if only you with your power which i'm sure you will and can and definitely do this world has to realize the simple truth now there are people on the other side who don't want people to realize this truth because if ever they come to realize this truth <laughs> sorry to say then all the drama that is being used in the form of religion i have a big temple i have a big temple and the temple has huge amount of funds that are coming as uh, do- donation to the, and every penny we used to we have humanitarian homes which run which take care of 600 to 800 people every day today we are serving lunch to over 600 people beautiful beautiful because every human being is a manifestation this of is, god this is real puja this is real prayer this is real meditation this is this is karma yoga this is using <laughs> using every minute every moment every action to get closer to the divine and also as an expression of that yoga right i mean yoga's union yeah. karma yoga then what we also think of as meditation off the mat meditation in action prayer in action is any action that is rooted in the soil of oneness the soil of union and any action that leads to greater union so it's beautiful to hear about the <laughs> the karma yoga the meditation off the mat i've seen this is true for all spiritual people anybody who's deeply spiritual anybody who in their meditation in their yoga in their prayers has really true spiritual experiences they will stand up off that mat and they will serve yeah. because if you don't then your meditation is not actually real the yoga is not actually real because that experience of of oneness that we experience when our meditation is deep and real stays with us it's not oh when my eyes are closed i'm one with all when i'm sitting in padmasana <laughs> i'm one with all then i open my eyes i stand up off the mat and you and i are separate you can be hungry i'm full you can live on the streets i can live in a mansion when i stand up from my meditation that same experience of being one with all stays with me. So I become therefore an instrument of service of karma yoga, of healing. But you beat all. me. You beat me to it. You know what you beat me to it? We're not in a race. We're going together. We're going hand <laughs> in hand. We're, we're walking no, you, walking No, you together. jumped to karma yoga, but in reality for 30 years I thought I was doing good karma. Now you know the where I'm coming from. The people say I I am serving that I how many people come to the Parmarth ashram and say mujhe seva karna hai I want to do mujhe donation dena hai as if they brought the donation when they came out of the mother's womb as if they carried a check book of a million dollars with them what we don't realize so I was doing seva for 30 years as good karma and even in the west karma is a very good concept but people don't understand Yeah. Sadhvi, what they think, and Shiv, you have a different view. They think, oh, don't do bad karma, do good karma. Of course, very good. But they think, do good karma, you will get God. They don't realize that when you do good karma, you are planting a good seed. Now, if you plant a good seed, you have to be rewarded for it. and either you will be rewarded for it now or you will be rewarded by bringing you back on a next journey but the real 
purpose of salvation, nirvana, moksha is to be free from karma. And that's why you beat me by saying jumping into karma yoga. And here I'm going to touch also a very important thing of the ashram, which I feel since we are having a free flowing discussion today, the misunderstanding of the word yoga. Now in the Western world, it is hot yoga. I mean, <laughs> I can't tell you the, the funny names that I've been hearing. But people don't understand yoga, which is probably born out of Rishikesh where we are sitting today. And I came in my talash 10 years back searching in Rishikesh for real yoga. And I could hardly find because everybody is doing yoga as asana and pranayama. But even Patanjali said, it is not just pranayama and asana. You've got yama, niyama, asana, pranayama, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, samadhi. Now you are already meditative as I see you. You're a, you're a yogi because you're always in yoga. I can see the yogic energy from you. But the point I'm trying to bring, people don't even know that yoga is yuj, is union. Whether it is meditation or dhyana yoga, action or karma yoga, bhakti or uh, the yoga of divine uh, connection, devotion and jnana yoga. Without jnana yoga like Vivekananda said, how would you realize the yoga of education and wisdom? So somehow our challenge, I believe, me doing whatever I'm, I have given up my life, my business, everything for this purpose. And you've given up Hollywood for the, <laughs> and your Western life to come here. But we have a challenge, I believe. And give me your thought on this. I believe as an instrument of the divine. Till we have breath, till that moment the body has death, we have to help people realize the truth and realize the purpose of life and realize that you are God. And you're going on a journey outside to search for God, but actually you've got to go for the voyage inside. And I was blessed that my guru told me, go on a talash. I picked up all the scriptures, picked up hundreds of books one day, 31st of August, 2014, 10 years back. I changed my name. My name was Ravi. And when I flight landed from Paris to Bangalore, I said, I am not Ravi. I am the soul, the Atma in Ravi. And so I became Atma in Ravi and now I'm called air. Because <laughs> so tell me, do you believe that there is this confusion in yoga and people are lost? And what do you feel is the way out? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So you've, you've touched on so many important and beautiful topics. I mean, well, take them. <laughs> Take them all because they're all really core aspects. Karma. Yep. And this whole aspect of our realization. So first of all, yeah, there's definitely a big misunderstanding around karma. Not only in the West, but also in India. Oh. Um, the seed analogy that you gave is exactly right. Karma literally means action. It's what the word means. Karma is not what you get. Karma is what you do. So what we do has ramifications. It's a law of nature. Newton gave it very similarly. So karma is a law of science, a law of nature. You plant an apple seed, you're gonna get an apple tree. Not because the universe is rewarding you or punishing you, but simply because you've planted the seed, therefore that is the tree you're going to get. Should you turn out to be allergic to apples and therefore it feels like bad karma to have this apple tree, instead of bemoaning your fate or being angry at the universe or looking for, you know, someone with a magic wand to turn your apple tree into an orange tree. <laughs> the question becomes, number one, when and how did I plant this apple seed that's clearly now bringing me something that is difficult in my life? 
I'm allergic to apples. I've got this big apple tree in my front yard. Every time I, you know, breathe it, I break out in hives. <laughs> so how and when did I do that so I can be sure not to do it again? Number one. Number two, how can I see this apple tree? as actually not an obstacle on my path, not a punishment, because karma is not a system of rewards and punishments. It's a big myth that people have. They say, oh, you're rich in this life. You must have done something really good in a past birth. <laughs> or, oh, you're poor. You must be being punished for something. Karma is not a system of rewards and punishments. We get exactly that which we need to take our next step closer to God. Because the universe doesn't have an agenda that we should be president of a company or president of a country, <laughs> or that we should be, you know, a, a millionaire or a billionaire or any of that. The only agenda of the divine is that we wake up, that we have that awareness that I am, I am not this body, I am soul, I'm spirit, there is no place I end and you begin. So we're going to get on our karmic journey. All of that which we need to take that next step closer and closer to the divine. So going back to the apple tree metaphor, so question one, I try to figure out when I planted this seed that's causing trouble in my life so I don't plant it again. So I don't make the same mistake again. But then number two, which is just as important, is I realize, okay, this tree is not here as a punishment. It's not here to create unnecessary suffering for me. What is the lesson, the growth I'm supposed to have through the presence of this apple tree? Maybe it's about inviting all of the local school children to come and pick the apples <laughs> after school, yeah. right? Maybe I've been given this apple tree along with my own allergy to apples so that I have to reach out and find all of the local kids to come with their baskets and fill them up with apples or so that I can learn to make apple pie or apple jam that I can give out Absolutely. to people. My prayer then becomes not, oh God, turn this apple tree into an orange tree, <laughs> but oh God, show me how to use this apple tree in a way that benefits others. And if you really want to give me like, extra blessings, stop being allergic to it. Let me be able in whatever circumstance you've put me to be able to thrive. There's, there's this beautiful line in the prayers that we chant here at Paramarth Nikathan every morning that says, Jahe vidhi rake ram, tahi vidhi rahiye. Wherever you are putting me, wherever you put me, God, in a mansion, in a shack, wherever you put me, just let me recognize that that is your blessing, that is your prashad, and let me live in joy and in happiness in that situation. So that's that's the aspect around okay. karma. With regard to the aspect that actually the ultimate point is to be free, absolutely. I mean, this is this is core Bhagavad Gita teaching. Arjun says to Krishna, Oh my god, I'm gonna kill them. I will get bad karma. Mm. He says, then I don't want to do it. Forget it. I don't want the karmic repercussions of this war. I'm going to just go off to the mountains, become a sadhu, <laughs> meditate. And Bhagwan Krishna essentially says, no such luck. Like, yeah, you can run off. You can negate your dharma. You can forsake your dharma. You can not fulfill your dharma. But do not think that by running off to the mountains, somehow you're not going to be accruing karma. Because not acting is just as much action as action. Absolutely. If I'm walking down the street and somebody trips and falls in front of me and I ignore them, 
that's an action. Yeah. Inaction becomes action. Absolutely, that is an action. And there are going to be karmic repercussions. Either way, I bend down and help them. It's karma, it's action, there will be repercussions. We would call that good <laughs> karma. Yeah. Some sweet fruit. Yeah. I ignore them, I walk around them, I walk over them, I pretend I didn't see it. There will also be karmic repercussions for that. Not so sweet. But either way, you're getting fruit. So that's when Arjun says, to karunkya, what to do? If ultimately the goal is moksha, to liberate myself from this cycle of karma, what to do? And this is when Bhagwan Krishna says, Yat karoshi yadashnasi, yaj chahoshi dadasiya, yat tapasya se kaunteya, tat kurushwa madarpana. The only way out, the only way out of this cycle of birth and rebirth is surrender to me. Whatever you do, just offer it to me. Anything that flows through you, do it in my name. Do it as an instrument. Do it with this namitta matram bhav. Be an instrument. And that's how you free yourself from the cycle of karma. He calls it karma yoga. Exactly. And this is, this is karma yoga. You have to act. But you act in a way that you recognize you're just a vehicle. You're an instrument. You're a channel. You're not the one doing. So, so that's karma. <laughs> then shifting into yoga for a moment because you've touched such an important aspect of yoga that especially in a place like Rishikesh is so important because this is really the yoga capital of the world. Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's the birthplace of yoga. There's probably more yoga studios here per square kilometer than anywhere else in the world. No doubt. <laughs> You enter Rishikesh, there's a big sign that says, you know, welcome to Yoga Nagari Rishikesh. <laughs> but you're right, most of the places you go, it's asana. And you know, it's really interesting in the Bhagavad Gita, which is 700 verses on yoga. I mean, it's, it's given to us as a treatise of yoga. Mm -hmm. Nowhere is there any mention of any asana or pranayam exercise. In fact, the only mention of the word asana at all is when Bhagwan Krishna speaks about preparing the seat upon which you will sit. And he talks about what it should be made of. It shouldn't be too high or too low. It shouldn't be too soft. It shouldn't be too hard. He's talking not about the posture but about, you know, the asana, the asana that we actually, <laughs> the thing that we sit on. Uh, and then he says, he says, once you are established in asana, once you are established in asana, matlab, once you are seated upon your asana, then you are ready to begin the practice of yoga. There's nothing more clear that I've seen that distinguishes asan from yoga as that. Beautiful, very beautifully said. Right? Once you're established in asan, then you begin, you're ready to begin the practice of yoga. Yeah. Meaning yoga is not asan. Asan is a part of it, asana. critical part, yeah. but it's not the fullness of yoga. And so, yeah, there's, there's a big misunderstanding and misconception. <laughs> And, you know, we host this huge international yoga festival here every year at Paramarth Nikitha. Okay. And we have thousands of people who come from all over the world, about a hundred countries come. And so many different styles of yoga, so <laughs> many styles. And people ask me a lot, you know, doesn't it bother you? Goat yoga, this yoga, that, I mean, like there's, as you say, there's all kinds of yoga. People are saying this yoga, that yoga. And what I always say is none of it bothers me because ultimately at the end of the day, you're entering the stream of yoga. And whether you get in through something called Ashtang yoga, Jiva Mukti yoga, Iyengar yoga, Patanjali yoga, yoga, 
goat yoga. I mean, even like the ludicrous stuff on the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. If it's actually bringing you into the stream of yoga, the power of yoga is so strong that even if people go in because they think, oh, my knee is bad, my hip is bad, I want to lose weight, yeah. I've got blood pressure. Very good, yeah, very good. Doesn't matter. Enter through asan, no problem. Enter through pranayam, no problem. But, as you mentioned so beautifully about the whole eight limbs, the ashtang yoga, asan is only limb number three, right? You began with yam and niyam. If you're going to build a building, you cannot start on the third floor. You need no architect, no contractors can say, "Oh yeah, no problem. You don't want you don't want your first and second floor. No problem. We'll we'll just start on the third floor." Foundation the one chain. Yeah. You need a foundation. Yam and niya are the ways that we live in the world. Yeah. And I always emphasize to people, you know, at those times of yoga that if you don't bring yam and niyam into your life, because of course they're not religion, right? We're talking non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, non hoarding Restraint, certain restraint, restraints and certain all disciplines. Of this, if you don't live based on that, if you live in a way that is violent and untruthful and you're stealing and hoarding and there's no integrity in your life, then whatever you're doing, is exercise not yoga? So what it's I wish aerobics. I wish you know, what you said is so beautiful. Maybe the only divine thing should be that they should not stop at asana and focus on asana. They need to open that door and say this goes forward. Absolutely. So we need a foundation, as I said, yam and niyam. But we also don't want to stop on the third floor. We want to realize that this tree yeah. goes all the way up to samadhi and. Like with any tree, the fruits, the sweetest fruits are hanging the closest to the sun up there. So you want to you wanna go all the way through asana, through pranayama, through pratyahard, through that. And so we're bringing the senses to a single point. We're concentrating through dhyan, through meditation, into ultimately that experience of samadhi. And like you said, the Bhagavad Gita is a text of yoga yeah. and it tells you if you are not doing asana and pranayama, if that is not the Patanjali yoga is not your path and you're doing seva like Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa was doing karma yoga. Absolutely. She did not, she did not have to do asana because some people are quite confused. They think if you don't do asana and if you don't do uh, pranayama, then you can't be you know, I always tell the Westerners, very simple, your SIM card, your SIM card has a union with the satellite. If you and me are sitting here, Sadhiji, and I'm calling your mobile, I'm not calling you from here to here. If the satellite is not working, the message is going to the satellite and then coming to you. And we all know it. But unfortunately, in Hindi I say, Yogi jo yog me sadahi rahe. Prabhu ke yog me rahe, samsar ki maya me wo na fase, bhog se wo bache. The point is that be in yoga, don't be in bhoga. Yes. Correct? I mean, you agree with me? Absolutely. And so, of course, we'll move on because I only want to share one beautiful thing. I think you'll like it. Be the seeker. 10, 12 years back when I started my search, my quest, I was like anybody else, like you were in Hollywood. <coughs> I was down south and, and I was trying to do meditation, trying to do karma yoga. I started the charity 30 years back. Yeah. I built a temple 30 years back. So there was bhakti yoga, there was karma yoga, little bit of dhyana yoga, but there was no jnana yoga. Mm. But Sadhvi, what happened in the temple one day, I used to sing. And I used to tell God, God, I want to love you. I seek you. I want you so much in 
अगेन वन पॉइंट आई राइट आई सेड है ये आस्था मुकम्मल तुम ही हो जीवन में मेरे और कुछ नहीं हो कन कन मेरा तुम बस तुम ही हो और कुछ भी आए जगह नहीं हो मेरे तन मन में मुकम्मल तुम ही हो बस एक तुम ही हो बस एक तुम ही हो मेरे दिल में बस एक तुम ही ओ लॉर्ड फिल मी फिल मी सो डीपली डोंट लीव एन एटम एंड दैट्स व्हेन आई गॉट प्रेम योगा I've I've written a book called Prema Yoga, which yeah. means don't love the skin, love the divine that is within. If you want to love God, God is all. See God in all, serve God in all, love God in all. And if only people reach this state, then this is mukti, this is moksha. Yeah. So, what do you? What is your thought on? Ab- absolutely, this this experience of. loving that essence that bhakti yoga which of course goes with gyan yoga because when you love god you connect with god when you connect with god you realize god and that's ultimately gyan yoga i mean you can enter the stream however you want here's parmarthnikana we're on the banks of ganga You want to go into Ganga, you can walk down our beautiful marble steps and have a dip in Ganga. You walk up river, you'll get to Ramjula. There's a sandy beach. You can walk into Ganga from the sandy beach. You want to walk a little farther up river, you'll get to Lakshmanjula. They've got some rocks there that people like to jump off of into Ganga. It doesn't matter how you get in. because ultimately the point is bas dubki laga get in have a bath <laughs> that that blessing of ganga doesn't depend on how you get in whatever works for you because ultimately every path is going to connect you to the full river this bhakti gyan kar raja yoga these different paths of yoga they're different starting places and there are different pathways but they take you into the same place and ultimately therefore they all overlap it's like once we're in the river the fact that you got in off of a sandy beach and i got in because i did you know a triple back flip off of a rock or something it's irrelevant yeah, yeah. and we're in exactly the same spot so start wherever it feels easy for you for a lot of people loving god feels like the easiest thing for a lot of people that feels really challenging and i love you know what you said about loving what's within not the skin because when people feel challenged to love god people a lot of times say you know how do i develop more bhakti and what i always explain is if you have trouble kind of loving god in the form of any of the different manifestations we have of sanatan dharma or any religion it's okay love anyone love anyone love anything as long as what you're loving is essence rather than form so if i love you as just your body that's lust whether it's sexual or not if you see someone as an object either an object that is a hindrance on your path an obstacle on your path or you see someone as an object you can use to get ahead you see them as someone who can bring you pleasure you see them as someone who brings you pain whatever it is that viewpoint of objectification ultimately it's what leads to lust love is when actually what you're loving is essence and so when you love anyone you love your child you love your spouse you love your parent you love the tree in your backyard if what you love is the core essence 
not just the form, then what you're loving is God. A, you're actually properly loving that being rather than just lust, but even more importantly, you're loving God because the essence of all of us is God. So if I love you at the truth of who you are, not just what you look like today, not just how you speak today, not just what you're doing today, but ultimately content rather than form, right. what I'm loving is God. So that bhakti, we can enter that stream of bhakti actually through through loving anyone. You can love you can love a sunset, a sunrise, as long as you're understanding the essence of that. The power. The creator. Yeah. You know, it's like if you have kids, do you have kids? Yeah. So when your kids were young, they probably came home from school with different art projects and, you know, drawings and things they did. Now, if you can remember when the kids were really young, they would come home with, you know, scribbles on construction paper. A normal person would say, Are kuch bhi yeah. it's nothing, it's just scribbles. <laughs> but you probably framed them and put them on the fridge. And you, wow, right? amazing. You loved them, you loved them. <laughs> but you loved them because you loved the artist. Yeah. And since you love the artist, you see the artist in all of the artwork. Art. Yes. In the same way, if we love a flower, love a tree, love a being, and can see the artist in that, that's also bhakti. Have you heard in India the term Satyam Shivam Sundaram? Of course. You, and you, you get the essence of that, right? Absolutely. So people, people in Bollywood are singing this song for the last five decades, but they don't understand. Satyam Shivam Sundaram, which means the truth is that God is beautiful. That when the when the divine leaves a rose, the beauty disappears. If I'm in love with you, and tomorrow God leaves you, the soul, the Atma, the Paramatma leaves you, all the beauty in you disappears. And you shrink, you shrivel, and we don't realize that. Satyam Shivam Sundaram. You know, in this song, I don't know if you've heard of this, it's a beautiful verse. I, want to, I don't know if you've heard this. It says, Rama Vadhume, in Ayodhya now, Rama Vadhume, Kashi Me Shiv, Kana Brindavan Me, Daya Karo Prabhu Dekhu Inko, Daya Karo Prabhu Dekhu Inko, Har Ghar Ke Angan Me. What is it trying to say? Yes. This he's trying to say, Oh Lord, may I see you everywhere. Manifesting is every home and every yes. home. Yes. So Sadhvi, even though it is so simple to realize God, why according to you is it so difficult? And tell me, according to you, who is God? What is God? Where is God? And how to realize God? I'm getting into now some structure <laughs> structured question. <laughs> To me, the question is not where is God or who is God, but where is God not? Who is God not? You know, in the Upanishads, it said so beautifully, Isha vasyamidam sarva, yat kincha jagatyam jagat. Everything in the universe is pervaded by the divine. There is nothing, no one, nowhere that is not pervaded by the divine. We also have the beautiful mantra teaching that says, Purnamada, Purnamida, Purnat, Purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purnameva Vishishyate, meaning that, the capital T, that God is whole, is full, is infinite, is poor. Whatever your religion may be, however you conceive of God, one thing everybody agrees on is God is infinite, right? If, if it's not infinite, it's not God. If it only exists here in this box, it's not God. <laughs> yeah, no, no religion says, oh yeah, this is God over there in that corner. The nature of God is infinite. Well, Ask any sixth grade student what 
infinity minus 10 is. And they'll tell you it's infinity, right? <laughs> infinity divided by 8 billion. Infinity. Infinity divided by 100 billion. Infinity. Meaning, every single thing that has been created, not just the 8 billion humans today, but every being who has ever been created, We've been created out of that. That's what the Purnama the Mantra means. Yes. Is that the divine is infinite, poor and full. This, meaning this here, that has been created out of that is also therefore by mathematical definition, full and whole and infinite. So what is God? We believe everything is God. You know, we did the Encyclopedia of Hinduism. It was one of Pooja Swamiji's major projects. It was about a 25-year project. Began in the late 1980s. Finally was published in uh, 2013 and 14 in America, here in India, Thanks in to England. You. All <laughs> over. It was, it was a great blessing to be yeah. able to be a part of it. But I mention it here, it's this whole 11 volume text. I, I mention it here because in this compilation of it, one of the things that was so important to help people understand is there's this myth, there's this misunderstanding that Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. Hinduism is not a polytheistic religion. We don't believe in many gods, but we're also not a monotheistic tradition. Monotheism typically believes one God, but one God with a certain set of qualities, characteristics existing in a certain aspect and way. We believe there is nothing but God. So what would you call as if it's not a, a polytheistic and monotheistic, what would you call Hinduism? We're not, there is no ism. I mean, we, <laughs> That's we, <it. laughs> we agree, we agree yeah. to use the word Hinduism that was given to <laughs> us by others. But that's why, that's why, you know, in the beginning I said, we're not a dogma, it's a dharma. There isn't an ism. You, you know, can't the, stick it in a box. The answer, Sadhvi, we have to go back to calling it Sanatana Dharma. We do. We because really as long do. as you're going to say Hinduism, and I want you to continue, but I'm interrupting you a little bit. The moment you said we, yes. the problem is not we. The problem is 1.5 billion we. And that's such wrong conditioning, whatever said in with all due respect, no, this Jai Shri Ram should be said with Jai Shri Ram as a power from the Ram inside, but not to condemn everybody else. The moment you are going to say Jai Shri Ram and you're going to put some people down, there is no Jai Shri Ram. So, <laughs> if you look at the life of Bhagwan Ram, you look at the life of Bhagwan Krishna, the, the embodiments, when Ram was here on earth, when Krishna was here on earth, you study the Ramayan, you study the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Mahabharata, you study all of this. And you look at what specifically did they say? What did they teach us? And across the board, obviously they had very different manifestations, very different leelas, but the teachings were very similar which is I, the divine, am in all. Absolutely. When Bhagwan Ram got his sena together, Sabko Gale Lagaya, Sabko Jorda, it was, it was an army of everyone. There was no Bed Bhav, there was no discrimination, there was no sense of, oh, you can't be part of our army. Jobiai. Uncle Bijora connected everyone. This is this is the teaching. So Jay Sri Ram is we love 
We love Bhagwan Ram, we love the teachings, we love the presence, we worship the presence, we love the sacred temple, we love the sacred land, we love our honorable prime minister for making this happen, and we actually also take the message of Bhagwan Sri Ram's life, and even beyond that, we say, okay, so Ram comes back to Ayodhya. And then what happened, right? We celebrate Ram coming back to Ayodhya every year on Diwali. Now on January 22nd, we have a Maha Diwali. <laughs> but after he came back, that was not the end. That was the beginning. Absolutely. I know I'm, com and I'm completely for it. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is really important because when we say Jai Sri Ram, it's a celebration of Bhagwan Ram, in this case also a celebration, a grand celebration of Bhagwan Ram coming back into this mandir in Ayodhya. Yeah. But what it also must mean is we are ready to create Ram Raja. Because when Ram came back to Ayodhya, that was when Ram Raja started. And what was Ram Raja? It was an era of peace, of rights for everyone, justice, there was no one who went hungry, there was no one who was homeless, there was no violence, yeah. there was no discrimination, there was no poverty, nobody was lacking in any way, there was sustainability, whether it was all of the humans, whether it was the animals, whether it was nature, everyone and everything lived in peace and love and harmony and sustainability. So with Jay Sri Ram is also must be an exuberant yes to being part of the creation and respect, of that Ram Raja. And respect everybody as Ram. Of respect course. Every, whether it does, no, no uh, uh, differentiating of caste, creed, religion, because we the whole, like you said, the Upanishad says, we are all one. Absolutely. And Bhagwan Ram lived like that. As I said, Sabko Gale Lagaya, Sabko yeah. Jorda. He brought everybody in. There was no conflict. There was absolutely no conflict. Yeah. yeah. So, so when people say God, I have a problem. I went to Hawaii <laughs> and there was a little girl sitting on the, on these, uh, in front of the ocean. I started telling her I'm from India. I know. It's so nice that uh, I come here because I come to the, I watch Dr. Robert Shulan, the Crystal Cathedral. He has a, he has a, a he has a, a sermon every Sunday. And then she says, "Don't talk of Hinduism. Only Christian. Only Jesus. Nothing but Jesus." So I believe the moment we use the word God. It goes back to Rama, Krishna, Jesus, other gods, Guru Nanak, Guru Sai Baba. But if we think of God as a SIP, S-I-P, a supreme immortal power, then the connotation of the God we grew up as we were kids will change. Our God may be Krishna, Rama, Jesus, but God is SIP. And the soul, S-O-U-L, is a spark of unique life. And the soul, comes from sip and goes back to sip. We are like a wave. The wave has no existence. The wave comes from the ocean and goes back to the ocean. If only we realize this. Yeah, and the wave never stops being ocean. Yeah. Even even when it's a wave, it's, it never stops being ocean. It appears to be a wave. So somehow if people can uh, realize this, I was asking you, so what is the way sure. to realize God? So, I love, I love the idea of this SIP. <laughs> the dilemma I think is I cannot see people of really any religion agreeing to call God SIP. But I think that what we can do is help people understand that God, the word that we're using, is this supreme, immortal, yeah, and an infinite presence oh, yeah. and power. Because 
when you speak about realizing God, you know, we say God realization or self realization, but ultimately they're the same thing. Realizing the supreme reality is ultimately realizing the self. This is the core of what we think of as Advaita Vedanta, as in literally there is only one, this non-dual core teaching of Sanatana that realizing the self is realizing God, realizing God is realizing the self. And the way to do it, you know, we have this beautiful prayer. I was speaking about this last night in the Arthi. We, we chant so frequently, it's a kind of core Hindu prayer. We chant Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamsoma Jyotirgamaya, Mrityordama Amritam Gamaya. And people usually translate that as, Oh God, lead us from falsehood to truth, lead us from darkness to light, and lead us from death to immortality. But first of all, it isn't three separate prayers. Second of all, if, if the divine, if God Brahma, the creator, created the universe in which everything that lives will die, everything that is created will ultimately go back to the elements, how in the world could we have a prayer in which we're essentially saying to God, make me the exception to your rule? <laughs> right? Like, how, how would our sages and rishis have given us this core prayer that said, Oh God, please throw away everything you've created. I want like the special deal. I want... It makes no sense. What the prayer really means is, Oh God, lead us from the darkness of ignorance of falsehood in which we identify as the individual self, which is born, which changes, and which dies. And in that darkness of ignorance, we suffer and we bring suffering to others. Lead us from that into the light of truth in which we realize and recognize that we are soul, we are spirit, we are essence, we are consciousness, we are divinity, we are infinity. We are all of that. So that God realization and self-realization, I think, comes from realizing what we're not. You know, you mentioned early on my memoir, Hollywood to the Himalayas. And for me, yes, on the one hand, the book is a, a story, true story, hmm. of my physical yatra from Hollywood to the Himalayas of being a 25 year old, you know, white American Stanford graduate in coming into India and becoming a Hindu nun, renunciant, sannyasi, spiritual teacher. But ultimately the reason I wrote the book was not just to share my personal journey because everyone's dharma is different everyone's purpose is different and in order to experience awakening transformation healing you don't have to be in the himalayas you don't have to start in hollywood and end up in the himalayas <laughs> but that's where the second journey is so important and this is that journey of self-realization where the hollywood way of thinking it's a mindset journey, you could say. One was the journey of my body, this, you know, fascinating and funny even that we talked about journey of how I got here. But the mindset journey is something for all of us. And it is that journey of darkness to light because the Hollywood way of thinking, which now sadly is permeating most of the world, is a way of thinking that says you are your body. Its size, its shape, its color, its race, its religion, its bank account, its relationships, its popularity, its followers on TikTok or Facebook or whatever <laughs> it is. And so we suffer. 
We suffer because we don't feel successful enough or beautiful enough or smart enough or popular enough. We bring suffering to others. Competition, anger, greed, lust, jealousy. The Himalayan way of thinking says you have a body, but you're not the body. You are soul, you are spirit, you are the divine, you are consciousness. So hum, aham brahm asmi, tatvam asi. All of these kind of mool mantras that remind us, I am the supreme existence. I am that. Thou art that, right? These are all ways of reminding us you're not the body. And when we make that mindset shift, that mindset yatra from the Hollywood way to the Himalayan way, it's not only that which brings us realization, but then it's also that which ends our suffering. Because all of that suffering then dissipates. So for me, I found that the, the realization comes by looking at what I falsely identify as and realizing I'm not that. So I'm not the body, obviously. I'm not my history, because that happened to a body that no longer exists. Like every single cell of my body that struggled, that suffered, that was traumatized when I was young. There's not one single cell of my body today that was there then. So if you say to me, who struggled? Who was traumatized? I cannot show her to you. She doesn't, she doesn't exist anymore. So I have to look at that and say, Neti Neti, not this. It's, it's not me. And then you look at the emotions we identify as, anger and pain and depression and anxiety and stories and personalities. And you realize every single thing that happens in our brain happens as a, an interaction of chemistry and electricity. Every memory, every thought, every emotion, Everything that you identify as self, as far as what happens in the thought process, in the feeling process, in the memory, the identification, it is all a pattern of electrical and chemical behavior in your brain. And as we realize, I'm not serotonin, I'm not dopamine, I'm not norepinephrine, obviously. <laughs> I'm not an electrical signal running down an axon into a synapse, obviously. Well, if I'm not that, then it means I'm not anger, I'm not depression, I'm not sadness, I'm not my memories, I'm not my feelings, I'm not my thoughts. All of that is just chemistry and electricity. So for, for me, that experience of realization has come from two places, both from the grace of the experience of the presence of the divine that I had standing on the banks of Ganga. And then through this practice, whether you say Gyan Yoga, or you say Swadhyay, or you say introspection, a practice of realizing I'm not I'm not that. I'm not this. And then there's this spaciousness that the Hindus call everythingness, Purnyata. The Buddhists refer to as nothingness, Shunyata, emptiness. But ultimately it's the exact same space. And into that space of everythingness, nothingness, you experience the self, you experience the divine, and... You know, you've said everything so beautifully. I have sent a kept a book for you. It's, my book is titled Neti Neti Tattvamasi. So the book title is that. When I started my journey, Sadhviji, in the book I write, started with nothing, achieved something, became everything, only to realize... I am nothing. I am nothing. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. <laughs> so in my book, I write that. But you have Beautiful. you have closed Beautiful. it so amazingly. I want to quickly take one or two minutes to conclude what you said. Sure. See, Sadhvi ji, people don't realize I am not this body. But scientifically, since you're a science student, we were not born on our birth date. That birthday is fake. We cut a cake, but we were born nine months before because then you can't change your mother once you're conceived in the mother. We see the body being formed in the womb. The body arrives on the arrival day. So I don't wish anybody happy birthday. I say happy arrival day. Yes. Then one day the body grows big. The body dies, and people. So I ask people, will you die? What is the common answer? No. You will you die? Of course not. Of course not. But the common answer is, of course I will, yes. because they think that they are the body. So I tell people, your loved ones will burn your body. They burn your body because you are not that body. So this realization, I am not the body. This realization, I am not the mind. If we try to find the mind, there you can't find the mind. If I am not the body, not the mind, not 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 what you said. But then who am I? Because I am. You are, and I am, and we both are that shakti. We are not vyakti. We are not the person. But you said it so beautifully. We can sit for hours. I think if we we can sit for hours yes. together, and this will never end. But I think it was an amazing conversation. I think that we have so much synergy, so much. Uh, all of this is in a small book I have written. I'd like to give you this book. It's called the Realizations of a Yogi. And it, you have to pull up, pull this side to open the book. This side, you pull it, pull, pull it open. It's. Uh, Ah, I see. Beautiful. So I just put the realizations together. Of <laughs> Thank you so much. It was such a such a blessing to have spent this time with you, and I think it was a divine. It was not a divine coincidence, but a divine design. Beautiful to be together. So beautiful to be together. Thank you for patiently listening to the video. And if you have questions, if you want to contact me, just WhatsApp me on nine eight four five one five double five double five. WhatsApp India nine one nine eight four five one five double five double five. But if you want to get answers to your questions, then come on Zoom, and the Zoom ID is on your screen. Every day at eight, you will find answers to all the difficult questions of life. See you there.